As a kid, Space Quest was my favorite adventure game series from Sierra when I first got into their many, many fantastic games from the 90s. It was its combination of equal parts the backdrop of futuristic space travel and its sarcastic and admittedly immature sense of humor which set it apart for me and made it tailor-made for a kid. The Space Quest series centers around space janitor Roger Wilco and his sometimes epic, sometimes hilarious, always wacky adventures and misadventures. Throughout the series, Roger tries to make more of his life and goes from janitor to starship captain and finally back to janitor. The series featured countless references, puns, and parodies of many properties, particularly Star Trek and Star Wars. Like most of the other Sierra Adventure game series which flourished in the 90s, it all ended much too early, in this case with only six entries. To paraphrase Space Quest VI though, but enough smarm, let's rank. Number 6, Space Quest II, Fohal's Revenge. Save for maybe one Sierra series, I can't help but notice that more times than not, in my opinion at least, the second entry is usually one of the weakest. I find that to be the case with Space Quest II as well. The game begins shortly after the events of Space Quest I, when Roger has just saved his home planet of Xenon. As usual, Roger is the butt of many of the series' jokes as his short-lived fame has come and gone, and he's now working as the head and only janitor on an orbital station. He gets kidnapped by a handful of goons working under the mastermind behind the attacks of the first game, Sludge Vohal. As revenge for thwarting his plans in the previous game, Sludge Vohal reveals to Roger that he is to be transferred to a labor colony and worked to death. En route, the ship transporting him foolishly runs out of gas and crashes, with Roger managing to survive and get away. After escaping the planet, Roger travels to Vohal's base, hidden deep inside an asteroid. There, Roger learns of Vohal's next scheme, to take over Xenon by launching an army of insurance salesman clones. Roger manages to defeat Vohal, ruining his plans once more in the process, and escaping the exploding base via an escape pod. Outside of the fact that Space Quest II establishes space-age janitor and all-around nice guy Roger Wilco's nemesis in Sludge Vohal, this game is the most throwaway of the bunch. If there had been a VGA remake back in the day like with the original when I was a kid, I might have come away feeling differently, but much of the typing got repetitive and downright frustrating in certain situations. I wouldn't bet my life on being able to figure out the right verbiage in less than five minutes to use for the part where you need to load a rock into the jockstrap and slingshot it at that guard who was protecting the shuttle you need to steal late in the game. This also led to some difficult and awkward time-based situations. An example is also late in the game on Vohal's asteroid base when trying to evade his robot sentries. To successfully complete some of these puzzles, the player had to drop the game speed all the way down to most effectively go through the sequence of actions they had to get off to survive and move forward. These scenes sometimes required a lot of trial and error, not to mention a ton of saves at each microscopic bit of progress you made. Still, there were a handful of memorable bits to it including getting shrunken down to the size of a mouse by Vohal, and the handful of final puzzles once you made it to the final escape pod. I understand there's a fan-made remake, so I ought to check that out and enjoy this game, minus all the gameplay flaws and cryptic typing solutions. Number 5. Space Quest 1. The Syrian Encounter Speaking of remakes, the first Space Quest did get a VGA remake by Sierra themselves, much like many of the other first installments in the various major series from Sierra at the time. This replaced the annoying typing bar with the classic point-and-click interface, allowing players to focus on the game and puzzles themselves, and less trying to deduce the language the designers needed to get the solution. Scott Murphy and Mark Crow, also known as the two guys from Andromeda, were two designers at Sierra who worked on early Sierra games such as King's Quest II and Black Cauldron. They discovered they had a mutual love of science fiction and decided to break away from the typical somber and serious game Sierra was making at the time and make something fun and silly. The result was Space Quest I, the Sierran Encounter. The Sierran Encounter introduces us to Roger Wilco, a lovable, loser janitor aboard a science research ship called the Arcada in an unidentified year in the future. Roger emerges from his nap in the broom closet to find the ship overrun with a violent race of aliens called Syrians, who are out to steal a piece of weaponized technology from the ship called the Star Generator. 
Roger escapes the ship in a pod and crash lands on a nearby planet. After securing a ship of his own, Roger decides to chase down the Syrian ship holding the star generator and sets it to self-destruct, narrowly escaping himself in the process. For his efforts, he is awarded the coveted Golden Mop, the highest honor in his profession, as reward for saving his home planet of Xenon. The first space quest covers a lot of ground, both literally and figuratively. It establishes early on the sense of humor that the two guys from Andromeda had, featuring a lot of puns, pop culture references, and general silliness. If you know what you're doing, it's also a pretty quick out as you could probably beat this game in about a half an hour. Even if it's your first time, most of the puzzles are pretty straightforward. Most importantly, in many ways, this game felt like a breath of fresh air and something unique for folks who maybe didn't get into the comparatively vanilla feeling of the flagship series, King's Quest. The sales reflected this as well as the Syrian encounter sold well over 100,000 copies and opened the door for a number of sequels and established this as one of Sierra's most popular series. Number 4, Space Quest 3, The Pirates of Pestilon. To me, Space Quest 3 felt like the point where the series really started to hit its groove. Taking place immediately after the events of Space Quest 2, the escape pod Roger Wilco puts himself into a cryogenic sleep in gets mistaken for space garbage and collected by a giant garbage scow. Roger awakens in said trash ship and has to rebuild another ship he finds using pieces of scrap he finds around the scow. Once in command of an operable spaceship of his own, Roger visits a number of locations including McDonald's inspired intergalactic fast food chain that I absolutely loved called Monolith Burger and a planet called Fleabutt in which he is pursued by a Terminator inspired killing machine all for a bit of mail fraud he committed in the previous game Space Quest 2. Roger stumbles upon some nefarious plans by a company called Scumsoft, the makers of an in-game game called Astro Chicken, and tracks them to their headquarters. There, after sneaking in under the guise of being one of the janitors, things get very meta very quickly as he discovers and rescues the two guys from Andromeda themselves, who've been captured and forced to make horrible games by Scumsoft. Roger subsequently throws down with the company CEO, Elmer Pug, facing off in a giant mech-robot battle, and Roger and the two guys escape in Roger's ship. The ending also gets about as meta as possible as a black hole sucks the ship in and drops them right on Earth in front of Sierra HQ where Sierra president at the time, Ken Williams, comes out and hires the two guys on the spot as Roger returns to his ship and leaves alone. I like that for the first time in the series you could pilot your own ship and head to a number of different destinations. I especially thought that Monolith Burger, an obvious play on McDonald's, was amazing and I was happy that they brought it back in Space Quest 4. More on this in a bit. When I was a little kid playing this game, I literally got excited at the belief that when I was a bit older, space travel like this would be commonplace. Sadly, advances in space travel haven't moved quite as quickly as my expectations, and I've just about given up on one of my childhood fantasies of taking my spaceship and docking at a fast food restaurant in space. Well, just about. This was the last Space Quest to feature the typing interface, but it was much more effective this time around, with less specific detail necessary in most cases to get the results that you wanted. There was also the option to use a mouse, so movement was also more precise than in previous games. Graphically, there were also a few improvements, and I like the not quite fully improved, but better than Space Quest 2 sweet spot that they hit in this game. It also offered up a bunch of gameplay variations to help keep things fresh. This included piloting a ship to choose where you want it to go with some element of independent choice in the middle part of the game, using a garbage vaporizer to believably act as a janitor in the Scumsoft HQ, fighting the giant mech battle with Elmo, and the subsequent, but admittedly overly simplified dogfighting in the final playable escape scene. Space Quest 3 felt like a big step forward for the series and, as I said, the point where things started to get really, really good. Number 3, Space Quest 6, The Spinal Frontier. Space Quest 6 was the only game in the series to have little to no involvement from either Scott Murphy or Mark Crow. After having nothing to do with Space Quest 5, Scott Murphy was brought on as a creative consultant but left shortly before the game's release after disagreements with Sierra came up. He was consequently annoyed when Sierra advertised the game as if one of the guys from Andromeda, Scott, was solely responsible for it. Still, 
actual lead designer Josh Mandel did a fine job with the final entry in the Space Quest series, and it remains one of my favorites. After making Space Quest IV a fully voice acted and narrated game, and incidentally one of the best voice acted games of all time from Sierra, but skipping this feature in Space Quest V, they thankfully brought it back for the last game. Most notably, they thankfully brought back the same narrator from Space Quest IV in Gary Owens, who delivers the many wacky descriptions of the game with hilarious precision. Space Quest VI sees Roger Wilco, despite having once again saved the universe in Space Quest V, relegated back from garbage scout captain to second class janitor on SCS Deep Ship 86 after violating a few minor regulations. Come on, Starcon, Roger even admittedly fought back an overwhelming urge to divert to Disneyland at the end of the game in order to get your ship back. I mean, the guy's a saint. Instead, and as usual, it seems Roger's accomplishments only receive the lasting attention of the bad guys, as this time an evil, old, withered woman plots to transfer her brain into a younger body, in this case, Roger's. A new love interest is introduced in the capable and curly-haired Starcon officer, Stellar Santiago, though Roger seemingly remains oblivious to her feelings throughout much of the game. After saving Roger's life and trading places with him, Roger fights to rescue her from Sharpay's clutches before her transformation is complete. The game sees Roger going to different planets, piloting his own stolen ship, and even traveling into a very early depiction of the internet known as cyberspace. The game ends on a cliffhanger, and even wonders aloud what his true love interest from Space Quest V, Beatrice, will think of Stellar. Sadly though, no seventh game was ever made. Stellar is notable to me as being arguably the only major character in the entire series that comes to mind who treats Roger with respect and is an equal from the start. It kinda makes me like her, to be honest. Actually, between her, the automated holographic co-pilot, and that poor sweet robot Sydney that Roger continually exploits for his own personal gain, Roger has a few sources of respect in this one. Not a big deal, but some part of me actually does appreciate that. Number 2. Space Quest V – The Next Mutation The departure of Scott Murphy saw the two guys from Andromeda splitting up before Space Quest V, leaving Mark Crow as the lead designer on this one. After the events of Space Quest IV, Roger decides to live up to his destiny and works to better himself and his standing. He takes the infamous Starcon aptitude test early on in the game, and thanks to some cheating and a technical glitch, Roger gets the highest score ever recorded. As a result, he is fast-tracked and moves up the Starcon ranks to instantly gain command of his own ship. Sure, it's appropriate that it's literally a garbage ship, but it's a ship nonetheless and Roger is finally in command. After a few routine garbage collection missions of going around and sucking up entire planet's collections of garbage, another Terminator-like android like the one from Space Quest 3 comes after Roger for that same mail fraud he committed in Space Quest 2. After besting this android too, Roger begins to gain the respect of his slacker crew. As things progress, Roger learns of some illegal waste dumping activities by his arch-rival and superior ranking officer, Rames T. Quirk. The waste is a sort of mutagen which poisons Quirk and his crew and threatens to take over the galaxy before Roger and his crew step in to save the day, defeating Quirk in the process. Unfortunately, and as previously mentioned, they rushed this one a bit to get it out so that there was no voice acting this go around, which means the world was deprived of someone taking a crack at Quirk's Gaston-like ego-inflated boasts. Graphically, the game looks a lot like Space Quest IV, and it plays pretty similarly as well. Like other Space Quest games, there are a number of mini-games to break up the standard gameplay. This includes a space-themed game of Battleship, and heading out into the middle of an asteroid field to rescue your ship's handyman. Space Quest V also has the distinction of being one of the first Sierra games to be sponsored by a company, or in this case, Sprint. I'd be curious to know how much the telecommunications company paid to get their logo included, but it was mostly used as a gag throughout the game, with most on-screen conversations on your ship ending with said logo and the tagline, brought to you by Sprint. This actually ended up being pretty funny with the logo popping up after some pretty dire conversations. There's even a back and forth between two guards in the space bar in which one recalls a recent anecdote where a telemarketer called him and solicited him to change providers before the guard pledges his undying loyalty to Sprint. It's nice finally having command of your own ship for once as well as it feels like this was a long time coming in a game and series set in futuristic space where space travel is ubiquitous. 
you can travel to a number of different planets using codes, which double as password protection. And it's fun chatting back and forth with your various crew members at different points in the game, from the surly repairman Cliffy to your sarcastic nav and communications officers drool and flow. Just a solid all-around outing for Roger Wilco in his penultimate adventure. And it's good enough to land at number two on this ranking of the best Space Quest games. Number one, Space Quest IV, Roger vs. the Time Rippers. Space Quest IV is the final game in the series to be designed by both of the guys from Andromeda, Scott Murphy and Mark Crow. Maybe it was that commitment in part which helped make it my favorite out of the bunch, but this game takes its deserved spot as the best Space Quest game in the series. At the beginning of Space Quest IV, we find Roger going on and on about his previous heroics to some of the local alien life in a bar on Polysorbate 60. A couple of goons bearing the likeness of police officers escort Roger outside and shock him by showing him a holograph of Sludge Vohal, Roger's longtime adversary. Vohal is not only alive and well, but gives the goons the go-ahead to rub Roger out before a couple mysterious rebels appear from nowhere and decapacitate the goons. One of them creates and throws Roger into a void. On the other side, Roger pops out to find he's on some dystopian version of his homeworld, Xenon. A quick look up at the menu bar at the top of the screen reveals that Roger is now in Vohal's revenge. We subsequently learn that Sludge Vohal has survived and gained power in the future, and Roger must travel forwards and backwards through time in order to save humanity once again. This involves Roger meeting his son from the future, and even getting a glimpse of the woman who will one day become his wife, Beatrice from Space Quest V. Space Quest IV obviously introduces the element of time travel to the series, and works a lot of its humor out of this mechanic as well. My favorite instance of this is when he takes the time car back to Space Quest I, and stops off in the Eulens Flats bar. The entire world looks exactly as it did in the original EGA version, and it's especially hilarious when they do a close-up of the poorly animated, blocky bartender, and give him a voice to deliver his one line of, Hey! You the guy who broke my slot machine. <laughs> you owe me some money. In a nod to when Roger did just that in the first Space Quest. Much of the game takes place in Space Quest <laughs> the latex babes of Estros. They have some more fun with the unseen timeline in the handful of quote unquote games, which occurred between 4 and 12, inventing some backstory that Roger is unaware of where he once dated the gorgeous leader of the sexy and badass titular latex babes of Estros. There's a pretty lengthy bit which takes place in the futuristic mall of Estros, which sees Roger dress up as a woman to fool an ATM, and even features the magnificent return of one of my favorite Space Quest icons in Monolith Burger. Like with most games in the Space Quest series, there are a number of fun minigames worked into the plot throughout. In this case, Roger's on the line at Monolith Burger, assembling burgers for one buck a to pop. Not a bad commission if you ask me, though inflation may have something to do with that. Like Lucy Ricardo on the chocolate line, the assembly line continues to speed up until it's virtually impossible to keep up with demand and you ultimately get fired. Of course, you can hack around this by lowering the game speed, something Lucy never had, so you can theoretically sort your retirement out simply by working at Monolith Burger for all eternity. The voice acting in this game is among my favorites of all time. Gary Owens makes his debut as the exquisite narrator nailing the sarcasm or epicness of each line flawlessly. There are countless priceless lines throughout the game, which are brought to life throughout the fantastic voice acting. Whether it's the aforementioned bartender recognizing you, or the manager at Monolith Burger ironically snarling through his cigar after you've been fired, that his janitor could do a better job than you, my brother and I randomly pull out dozens of quotes from this game often. Space Quest IV is ultimately the funniest game in the series, as well as being the heaviest and darkest. For every comedic instance like deleting the mysterious Leisure Suit Larry 4, there are moments which terrified me to my core as a kid. As Mr. Owens observes near the start, in Space Quest <laughs> Xenon has become a bit of a pile, with only a handful of zombie husks of former residents walking about. At first glance, these wandering creatures seem innocuous enough until you walk closely enough to one of them, resulting in a terrifying and drawn-out nod to Invasion of the Body Snatchers, in which a look of sheer terror slowly spreads over the being's face, and they ultimately scream until a guard bot comes by and vaporizes you out of existence. This game also has the most moments of drama out of the predominantly comedic and silly series, including the bittersweet moment of finally meeting your son for a few brief moments at the end, and getting the details of your life, 
and the hint of the premature loss of his mother and your future wife. The ending also makes me pretty curious as to where they were going to take this series to fill in those plot holes had the two guys stayed on to continue to develop games. Not to mention what they would have done had they ever actually gotten to a 10th game in the series. The business side of game development being what it is, however, ultimately meant that this would be the last game that both guys would actively develop together, and it stands as the strongest in a fantastic adventure gaming series. So there you have it, my ranking for the Space Quest series. Why not let me know exactly how wrong I am in the comment section below, and please make sure to subscribe to Let's Play with Brigands for more top 10 lists, let's plays, live streaming, and fun fun times.